I am so happy to have Alison Ord with us today. So Alison is a researcher at UWA and Mineral Dynamics Proprietary Limited, and her research is in structural geology, the mechanics of hydrothermal systems, computer modelling of coupled to form systems with heat and fluid transport, and the thermodynamics of chaotic systems. So her goal is to develop a new paradigm for mineral exploration based on non-linear dynamics. And it is going to be awesome hearing her insights today to go from chaos to prediction using complex system science in exploration. So it's going to be a great session. I hope you all enjoyed it. Please keep using the chat and we'll open up the floor at the end. And thank you so much, Alison, for joining. It's amazing having you. Thank you, Cam. And thank you, Jessica. And so thank you for this geo hug. We'll support this path from chaos to prediction. Uh, en route, it is involved in the alphabetical order by Christian name, myself, my co-author, Bruce Hobbs, Greg Hall, John Van, Julian Vernkam, June Cowan, Mike Nugas, Nick Oliver, Nico Tabo, Paul Hodkovitz, Stano Ulrich, Stephen Wolfram, Tim Krask, and Tom Blenkinsop, all of whom have provided data, tools, ideas, and a large whop of uh, reality. And as Je Jessica no noted, uh, I run um, a Mineral Dynamics uh, web pages, um, represent a little company I, I have. Uh, covering this uh, this research and the web pages include all of our um, our publications so this presentation addresses the following fundamental questions that face mineral explorers how do i make a decision whether to continue exploration or pull out using limited data even if the data consists of alteration assemblages rather than mineralization and what are the processes that lead to supergiant and giant hydrothermal mineralizing systems as opposed to small systems? Are there signals at small scales that indicate one is in a large system? And how do I know when I'm in a giant system? So our research has run along the lines that the answers to these questions depend on viewing mineralizing systems as open flow chemical reactors. The system evolves with time far from equilibrium and is controlled by the supply of heat and mass from some source which is external to the system. If one looks at the details of mass flow, heat flow, reaction rates, heat production consumption, there is commonly a supply demand problem. This arises because of the short life of mineralizing systems and fast reaction rates. Reaction rates can outstrip strip heat or fluid supply and the growth of a mineralizing system can then be viewed as a competitive process between supply of fluids and heat and consumption of fluids and heat. The growth of a mineralizing system depends on the rate of supply of mineralizing fluids to the mineralizing site and its history, represented by this figure on the left from Blenkinsop from representing fluids rising from a devolatilization isotherm in the mantle up to uh, the mineralizing, uh, local mineralizing system. And then the processes operating at that mineralizing site from a gold deposition, for example, at a biotite sericite reaction site and resulting in gold. The interactions are nonlinear. Each process has an influence on the others. And the probability distributions that develop reflect these interactions. This follows Savageo, who demonstrated that any nonlinear system that grows to maturity has a growth curve that is a legitimate cumulative probability distribution. This is what we explore. And here we look at some example chemical reactors with variable flow, fluid flow supply rates. Along the bottom row, we have some figures representing fluid flow evolution varieties. Fluid flow rate of y axis, time as the x axis. The first two have the fluid flow rate decreasing with time. The third one has a fluid flow rate increasing and then leveling off with time 
and the last one has a fluid flow rate uh, exponentially increasing with time. You can see how the variety might build up. The second row uh, refers to the reaction kinetics, and these eggs refer to the mineralizing system itself with this input fluid and an exhaust fluid. And in first column, we consider power law kinetics and columns two, three, and four Weibull kinetics, as they appear to be typical of heterogeneous chemical reactions. And a possible probability distribution arising from this, these evolutions with mineralization on the y-axis and time on the x-axis. We might get a power law distribution in the first column, a so-called Weibull distribution in the second, Frechet in the third, and Gumbel in the fourth. And you will know much more about these types of probability distributions, I hope, within the next hour. Let us then look at the history of an exothermal system. On the left-hand side, we have reaction rate on the y-axis and time or distance on the x-axis. We start with incubation of the system at A. The reaction rate ac accelerates up through B and would continue accelerating if it was not for this competition for supply of reactant or heat. The reaction rates uh, decrease to C and there is then depletion of supply of the reactant of heat to D. Let us now look at the cumulative distribution for X, which is being formed and gives us the Y axis. The X axis is still time or distance. And the first part of it is the same as we have just looked at. We have an acceleration up to B and at the competition side, we're still producing X but it decreases, so the curve turns over, and with depletion of supply of reactant or heat, the curve continues to turn over and level off. The precise shape of this cumulative distribution curve, and hence the endowment of the system, depends on the relative positions of A, B, C, and D. Nucleation, growth, and then extinction then leads to some form of sigmoidal growth curve. Further information will be forthcoming. Here we have three different sets of curves, blue, green, and red. The black dot is a maximum growth rate and is one over E for all of the green curves. It's greater than that and variable for the blue curves and less than that for the red curves. Let us now look a little bit more at probability distribution functions. Here I've put in some examples for a Weibull, Frechet, Gamma, and Log Normal. And in fact, the Wikipedia does a beautiful job of providing information on these. A probability distribution function versus X itself. Each of these is described by some mathematical algorithm and the Y bull has a couple of factors controlling its shape, shape and scale. The fresh A in this case also has two. There's an opportunity for three, and I'll refer to this again later in the talk. A gamma distribution, uh, an example of the extreme value set of distributions, and the classic log normal. And my, um, I've been using Mathematica for all of this uh, this work for which I'm most grateful. And if we now look back to the earlier figure, we find that the blue is the Weibull, green is Gumbel, Frechet is red. So systems that nucleate slowly, they grow fast and they die rapidly, are likely to follow a Weibull distribution. Excuse me whilst I have some water. Systems with a maximum growth rate exactly at 1 over E are probably rare, uh, correspond to Gumbel distributions. And as I have found some of these, systems that nucleate rapidly 
and the variable growth rates, but long lifetimes, are likely to follow fresh A distributions. And if we turn to our earlier diagram, looking at a hydrothermal system, we now look at probability against size. We have an early exponential section, a logarithmic section, a linear section. And this wonderful person, Frank, wrote how to read probability distributions of statements about process. And we determine this section here uh, to favor the Frechet, Weibull, and Preto one. In fact, this is a power law distribution and the size goes up for the gumbel and log normal and gamma covers the whole gamut of, uh, of these distributions. I say this is the classic extreme value collection. Given all of this, we expect the cumulative probability distributions for mineral abundance and endowment to be some form of sigmoidal distribution. This is true at all scales from regional to hand specimen scales. We should look at some of these. And if a mineral system does follow a common growth law throughout, it will be characterized by a common cumulative probability distribution throughout. Variations in the growth law at all scales are reflected in variations in the cumulative probability distribution at the various scales. Further, there's a spectrum of hydrothermal systems which reflects the variation in the growth kinetics controlled by the supply system and the competition for resources within the system. Systems that never reach steady state, start fast, grow fast, die early, they're likely to be low endowment systems. Those that can grow close to or faster than steady state for the longest available time are likely to be well endowed. Now these statements may appear intuitively obvious to some, but our question is how do we tell the difference when we have limited data, and especially if the only data we have are in the form of alteration assemblages? So what do we see? Now the following results are all derived by data from various sources at least some of whom the uh, people I referred to in the second slide, including drill core logging by people and by hyperspectral systems. This is just an example of the plots I'm about to, to show. We have a cumulative distribution on the uh, left, uh, the cumulate, sorry, the complementary cumulative distribution. This is just one minus the figures we have just been looking at so instead of the curves going from top right to bottom left, they go from top left to bottom right. Here, for example, we have gold from Salt Creek in Western Australia. Uh, this is against log gold in parts per million. So the big ones are here and the little bits are uh, here. And this is a probability plot. It's a plot of observed probability. The probability for the observed data against the probability for the modeled distribution, whether it's viable, fresh A, whatever. This diagonal little line here represents a perfect fit. So you can see that the deviations from it uh, at this small end reflect this huge deviation here. And in the bottom left for Sunrise Dam showing the opposite, we have a fresh A3 distribution. So that's three parameters in the math in the algorithm showing a particularly good fit in the probability plot as well, both showing the showing more so the deviation in the central uh, part, but you can see that at the, the ends, uh, this deviation from the large uh, observations is much better seen in the Cumulate complementary cumulative distribution plot than in the um, uh, probability plot. So now you understand those figures. We're going to look at some for ore body scale. And I've put in the, um, I can't see that uh, top bit. Uh, these are all looking at, uh, this is Sunrise Dam in Western Australia, A and B, the data in the solid black. And you can see uh, the, the red is a very bad fit. I'm just showing you what a bad fit looks like. The blue is a, um, a good fit and this purpley color is even better. And here on the 
probability plot, we see that this Pareto is way off again. The log normal is also not so good, and that the fresh A is giving us the best distribution. Salt Creek, here's the Weibull we looked at earlier. And again, log normal is a very bad fit, and the power law even worse. You might be getting the idea now. Here we have some data for the with Waters Rand. Not so uh, so much, and of course, more data is always welcome. The fresh A2 in green is a better fit than the log normal than the Y bull, and also from um, with Waters Rand in the lower row. Again, we have the both uh, fresh A as some um, uh, good fits, although the log normal is a much better fit at the uh, large values for gold. And at the regional scale, we have Abitibi. Here we have a very good fit with a fresh A distribution. Turkey on the top row, a good fit here with a Weibull distribution. And Zimbabwe, the best fit of the lot whatever you think of it here, as a fresh A distribution. Uh, and here for um, West Africa, we have good fits from Preto and fresh A. And uh, here we have better fits, although they're not, really not good at all, by log normal, inverse Gaussian. So you can see one would really prefer these fits and none of these. If we now look at a core sample from Sunrise Dam, again, it's for gold. These are fresh A's, and although I only show you one result, we do see extreme distributions at the scale of a drill core and as well at the regional scale. Let us now return to our previous figure and put some of these mineralizing systems into place. And I've put the Salt Creek down in this position Abitibi, Red Lake, Challenger, Sunrise Dam, all fresh A, more in this position, still developing. Beta Hunt actually covers the divide here. Beta Hunt is both a very good log normal and fresh A. Sukhoi Log, we actually have a lot of um, data from a Russian lady now in uh, South Africa, uh, log normal, and the Wit Waters Rand is only log normal. So the probability distributions appear to be the same at regional scale as they are at ore body scale. So the growth laws are scale invariant. And at all scales, Weibull distributions do indeed appear to be characteristic of less endowed systems, fresh A of well endowed systems, and log normal in fact characteristic of giant systems. So how further might we analyze even quantify these data? Consider entropy. You're out in the bush, we're geologists, you've had a campfire, you go home, back to the sleeping area, it's been raining, the wood is wet, uh, even your fire lighters won't work. You get this situation, it's low order, there's no flame structure, it's close to death, it's close to failure. This is a high entropy system. Well, you might have got something at this stage, though. It was a better day. Uh, you left the fire going in the morning and it's still smoldering in the evening. You, you blow it a little bit. You put a little bit more wood onto the system. We have moderate order. There's a weak flame structure. It is a working system. Just keep giving it a little bit more mass, a little bit more, 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 uh, Fluid flow, you keep blowing at it gently. This is a medium entropy system. And now here, we're all happy. It's highly ordered, there's an excellent flame structure. This is a successful system. It might have a low or negative entropy. And we are referring to something called the differential entropy here, which is allowed to be negative. So for our campfire, if we start looking at the analogies, we have wood plus oxygen plus heat, giving us carbon and more heat. Uh, providing all of which radiates into the atmosphere, drives convection in the atmosphere, boils water, an endothermic reaction. Consider the ore body. For example, we have case bar plus water plus heat, giving us white mica, more heat, and hydrogen ions. 
We have conduction into wall rocks. This drives convection in the wall rocks. Precipitate sulfides. This is endothermic reactions like boiling the water. Pyrite, chalcopyrite, boronite, arsenopyrite, all endothermic. And precipitates gold, depending on the hydrogen ions. So entropy, low entropy makes me really happy. We're not going to go through this. We just wanted to show you that there are formulae readily available for these common probability distribution functions. Here we have the Weibull, Fréchet, gamma, log normal. And these parameters, for example, of scale and shape are given here by the lambda and k incorporated in equations such as this. And the differential entropy is similarly defined in terms of these probability distribution parameters. And these are all easily accessible within, uh, within Mathematica. And I used that to explore the entropy for all the different deposits I've talked of and more. The different colors refer to the different mineralizing systems. So we have W in this orange for the Waters Rand, blue for Sigma Lamac, red for Sukhoi log, pink for Chertobo Corito, and V for Viso uh, which are crudely in the area of Sukhoi log. This bright blue for Salt Creek, Red Lake, Challenger, Beta Hunt, and the green for Sunrise Dam. The shapes are relative to the probability distribution uh, that best fits these data. Uh, so the circles are for log normal, the triangles are for Weibull, the stars are for gamma, and the boxes are for Fréchet. And I've ordered them from high entropy to low entropy. And we'll see we have the Witwaters Rand set in the high entropy, and all of the Sunrise Dam we have, in fact, a negative entropy. These are all fresche, the Witwaters Rand are log normal. Uh, and again, in the manuscript, I'll give you the reference for at the end, we give you the reference for the endowments for the various ore bodies. So here we give you another chance to look at what's happening. The differential entropy is proposed as a measure of the quality of deposit. The quality we interpret as the degree of organization or the inverse of uncertainty in the deposit. Disseminated or invisible gold are defined as low quality. So in fact, we're putting this lot into the low quality and the nuggety or visible gold defined as high quality. And each dot represents the entropy for the best fit probability distribution for that drill hole. And at a detailed scale, uh, this just shows the probability distributions for the individual drill holes from Sukhoi log. Uh, there were 10 of which the first five, I've labeled them, there's one, two, three, four, five, all increasing gently and then decreasing our log normal. And then we have three of them, six, eight, and 10, our gamma two, and seven and nine, these two are fresh A. And you can see the different form of the, um, the gamma two, especially this one number, number six, which is mostly about as broad as you can get. And here I've plotted them against the grade PPM as a weighted average, assuming the best fit distribution for each hole. So the lowest entropy is for these high quality drill holes and the highest is for these very flat uh, probability distributions. So entropy tells us something about the shape of the distribution, which is what we've just looked at. Given two probability distributions defined over the same range, the broader, flatter distribution will have the larger entropy, a fact consistent with defining probability as a model for uncertainty. 
we should be much less certain about the outcome of measurement modelled by a broad flat distribution than we are about one governed by a distribution having a single sharp peak. And Mikhailovich et al. actually had a handbook of differential entropy, approach entropy as either a measure of uncertainty of information, and in their experience, they interpret energy as uncertain to be, to be much more useful and much less prone to misunderstanding. So I've been trying to look at uh, our results and measures of, a, of entropy from that form. Jumping still through that chaos world for any dynamical system, it's important to gain some understanding of the dynamical attractor for that system, another tool. The attractor represents all the thermodynamic states a system can occupy and the probability density of each state. So it's a representation of all the chemical, physical processes that produced the system. And it's embedded in something called a phase space. Here, we're just going to look first at, at an attractor. This is, sorry, the attractor for the Rossler system. And we're looking at the evolution of the concentrations of three compounds. So here in the middle right, in red, compound X, in orange, compound Y, and blue, compound Z. And all we've done is take these and plot the X along this axis, Y along this axis, and Z against the remaining orthogonal axis. And during this, the system evolves through all three components and every now and again it changes and you get a lot of Z into the system. You can see these peaks here and it goes roundy, roundy, ups a daisy, roundy, roundy, ups a daisy. And the system repeatedly passes close to some former state on the attractor as it evolves. And here the trajectories of the system pass through states within this red ellipse, which we'll refer to uh, again. So here are some trajectories for alpha, beta, and gamma, alpha, beta, and gamma. <clears throat> and there are characteristics of states on this attractor. Here we just show one in two dimensions. These are low density, high density, recurrence, the system repeatedly visits these regions. We've looked at the multifractal characteristics of states elsewhere and recurrence. And here, the third characteristic reflects that the distributions of mineralization and of alteration are characterized by probability distributions that reflect the geometry of the underlying dynamics of the system. So that statistical probability distribution of points that define the attractor contains considerable information on the physical processes involved in forming the system. This is what keeps me going. And on the side of their N independent processes operating, the dimension of the phase space is N. Now for a hydrothermal system, N is large and we've been measuring them generally around the order of seven to 10. It's obviously more convenient to reduce the dimensions to three so that we can see them and we can construct a projection of the attractor in n dimensions into three. And we discovered an efficient way of doing this is to employ singular value decomposition. I'm about to show you some results for this. Uh, a very neat curiosity is that the data in a drill hole are in fact a one dimensional projection of the density of states on that n dimensional attractor. So here's our attractor. For, uh, for gold, chloride, sericite, dolomite. So you can see the, the forms are definitely similar for the gold, the chloride, the dolomite. Sericite is a bit more clustered. This is all for, uh, uh, for Sunrise Dam out of the one drill hole. And then we look at gold for Salt Lake Creek. Sunrise Dam with waters ran Sukhoi Log and another from Sukhoi Log and Challenger. And these do have remarkably similar forms. I've looked at many attractors. They do not all look like this. This is remarkable. 
and the similarity of the attractors for the various ore bodies highlights that similar physical and chemical processes operate in ore bodies, and it reinforces the suggestion that ore bodies differ in the details of the energy fluid supply processes together with those of the dissipative mechanisms. So what about within an ore body? Do the alteration assemblages reflect the growth? And again, we take Sunrise Dam as an example. These are now just plots for abundance of the raw data along the drill core, just raw data, calcite, dolomite, anchorite, sericite, sericite comp composition, the IR absorption wavelength is on the y-axis, chloride, and logarithm of gold concentration. Now, if we do a classic thing and plot the log gold against the um, calcite, dolomite, sericite, and the sericite wavelength, this is what we, we get. And if we analyze the cross correlation between the signals, uh, the only excitement, which is obvious, is that dolomite against dolomite, log gold against log gold, and so on is one, because the other cross correlations are negligible. There's a 0.19, uh, that's the highest, uh, and a pile of, uh, of negative. Um, in this world, no co cross correlation. Now, we continue through that. If we look at the sericite composition, we find it also has a fresh distribution in this particular case. And for dolomite, again, fresh is the best fit. And let us now return to our attractor with respect to recurrence. The attractor for a non-random system does not occupy all of the phase space. And the system repeatedly, we emphasize this now, passes close to a former state. And this recurrence through this region R is marked by alpha, beta, and gamma in this particular case. So when we're talking about recurrence in the next few figures, this is what we're talking about. And the joint recurrence plots portray the probability that two systems recur simultaneously, which will be the blues and greens in the neighborhood of a formerly visited point in their respective phase spaces. In other words, they tell us if parts of an ore system are closely related to each other. And here we have the plots for gold sericite composition, gold sericite, gold chloride, gold calcite, gold dolomite. Geologists are superb at recognizing patterns, and I hope you recognize the similarity of these, these patterns, perhaps a little bit weaker in, the, in some. So this analysis reveals that all parts of the system are part indeed of the same dynamical attractor and they're parts of the same physical system. It's not just the probability distributions, it's this joint recurrence analysis. And this is true even though the classical statistics, as we saw, says there's no correlation between these parts. So we should be able to predict grade using alteration the prediction is based on the tools for analysis of nonlinear dynamics using a variety of others, which we're not going into detail uh, here. We have mentioned the attractor and the recurrence plots. At the top left, we have gold in blue observed. The prediction for the log gold, this is going depth down hole, is in red. The patterns are crudely similar, although the magnitudes are a bit off. But the error is high for the first 10 meters and then decreases to less than one for the remaining 90 meters. If we look at the sericite composition, we find the same effect, but much better. We have very good matching of the pattern, a bit uh, off sometimes for magnitude. And in this case, the error is much less than one. And here's a bit of a shocking run for gold prediction between drill holes. The training set is on hole one, which finishes at this line. We then train it in this section. 
sorry, we put, we train on that section and we predict on this section where this is part of hole two. And here is our prediction. This is the start of the second hole. The data for this prediction area in hole two is in blue and our prediction based on hole one is in red. An error is still less than one, crudely similar, in fact, frighteningly similar. We now look at a sericite training set against log gold, and we predict over this section for the log gold, and here is our blue for the actual and our red for predicted. I still think that's a remarkable similarity in pattern. And here's the, uh, the error increasing gently towards one. Um, I'm just amazed it's so low. So that's prediction of gold using sericite as a training set. And here's prediction of gold, same kind of thing, using chloride as a training set, the actual in blue. So it even gets this little, little kick to predicted in red and the error decreasing to about one. So Kutz and his uh, colleagues, including a hero of mine, Steve Brunton, who works in this world, in this paper states that for systems driven by an energy input that competes with some forms of dissipation, resulting in nonlinear dynamics, pattern formation is a universal income outcome. So universal behavior is characteristic of many engineering, physical and chemical systems. And the organization of energy within the system as the energy flow is continually increased and dissipated is fundamental, not the specific chemical and physical processes that operate. Increasing the energy input to the system increases the opportunity for processes with higher and higher activation energies to be initiated and hence more and more opportunities for different dissipation processes to operate. This increasingly competitive environment is the fundamental controlling factor, not the detailed physics and chemistry. And this environment is what underlies the geology. Our science so important for the entire universe. So in conclusion, both mineralization and alteration uh, reflect the growth kinetics for the system. Despite the fol folklore, power law distributions are rare in mineralized system. Common distributions are members of the extreme stable family. Weibull distributions imply low endowment. Freshet imply large endowment, especially if the tail is long and fat. Log normal may be characteristic of huge systems. The statistics of the alteration and mineralization reflect the endowment. And the observations are what one expects from the theories of extreme statistics and thermodynamics. And our next step is to make predictions on the spatial distribution of mineralization and endowment. Similar analysis of data from the hardly drilled out, recently shown to me deposit in Western Australia demonstrates a log normal distribution. Would you be interested? We have uh, three papers out there in the open literature uh, discussing this work in the Journal of Structural Geology in or Geology Reviews, the Australian Journal of Earth Sciences, 2022-2023. Uh, and these are the references to um, some of the uh, people I talked about in the um, presentation. And I thank GeoHug and, and all of you for supporting this presentation through chaos to prediction. Thank you.